Good morning. I've heard it said many times, one of the most beautiful sounds is the saints communicating before and after the worship, and I've grown to love that noise as everyone catches up and talks about their week, talks about holy things. Thank you for being with us. If you're visiting with us, you're our honored guest. I look forward to talking with you afterwards, getting to know you a little bit better. At this time, we'll have a prayer followed by the scripture reading and then our songs. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this precious morning that we can come. Thank you for blessing us with another opportunity to come into your presence and to think on holy things, to reflect our lives to you. Help us to always have a humble heart, an open heart, an honest heart that will look into your word and measure up to see how we are living our lives, if it's, if it's in accordance to your law, the plumb line, Father, that we can measure to see if we're being righteous to you. We know, Father, that that comes from the heart. It's not just us following rules or wanting to follow rules, but rather wanting to have a relationship with you and wanting to be pleasing to you. Pray that you bless our time together. We pray that you'll be with those who are not able to be with us at this time for various reasons. Help us to be an encouragement to them. Help us to uh, communicate with them and to, to make them feel uh, missed, Father, and we do miss them every time that they're not able to be with us. Thank you for loving us and sending your Son. Pray that you'll bless us as we sing praises to you this morning as we remember your Son's death. We love you, Father, and we pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning will be from Psalm 71, verses 15 and through 18. Psalm 71, verses 15 through 18. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Good morning. Our first song will be Saints of Grimaldices.
in the nineteen and something years old. Good morning. There he sat, slumped against the hard, wet stone wall, waiting for the inevitable. It wasn't too long ago that Barabbas was a free man, and a free man with great ambition. He was a Jew who was living in the time of Jesus, He lived beneath an oppressive Roman rule in the city of Jerusalem. And he and a few other like-minded individuals had set their sights on revolution, overthrowing the Roman rule in their city. But things had not turned out for him and his compatriots as as he had hoped. Their attempted, attempted coup was totally unsuccessful. It was squelched by the power of the Roman government. And as a result... Barabbas was captured and sentenced for the crimes of insurrection and murder. And so there he sat, slumped against the wall in a dark prison, awaiting his fate on that one Friday morning. The prison which he occupied likely was a very uncomfortable and miserable sort of place. Prisons in his time were little more than than holes in the ground. It was probably cold, damp, mildewy, dark. It would have been dirty, filthy, and disgusting like you wouldn't believe. There would have been little light, if any light at all, in his prison. And surely it would have been cramped with low ceilings and little space. Hardly the kind of civilized cells that we give to our prisoners today. And this is the place where Barabbas was stuck, shackled, on this one Friday morning. But the conditions of his internment were were the least of his worries because Barabbas and everyone else knew that he wouldn't be staying there for long. Revolutionaries don't serve multi-year prison sentences under Roman rule. No, he knew that very soon the soldiers would come to carry out his sentence. And he knew exactly what that sentence would be. In a word, crucifixion. 
Even a, even a hardened criminal like Barabbas shuddered at the thought of crucifixion. As he sat there over and over again, the fear of his inevitable fate washed over him like waves. His heart would have raced. His palms would have become sweaty. His breathing would become short and shallow. The cross was horrifying, but he knew that the cross was his fate. And he knew, he knew that there was nothing he could do on that one Friday morning to prevent what was coming next for him. All of a sudden, as he sits there, he hears footsteps falling in unison. And he knows that sound. Everyone does. It's the sound of soldiers marching. They're coming toward the prison. And in his mind, he thinks, he knows, this is it. It's all over. This is my fate. The door of the prison is flung open, and the soldiers march in and roughly unshackle him and lead him out into the blinding daylight. But then he receives the most shocking and the most wonderful news. He's freed. He's been released. He's free to go. He's no longer in prison. He's no longer serving his sentence. And he's told he will not go to the cross. But someone named Jesus of Nazareth will take his place on this Friday. The story of Barabbas is, is remarkable, isn't it? It's not a surprise that all four of the gospel writers make mention of him as they tell the story of Jesus' death. The story of the criminal who was meant for the cross, who was freed from his fate because someone else stood in his place. I want you to appreciate this morning that, that Barabbas is a wonderful contrast to our Savior, to Jesus Christ. You know, we're told during the life of Jesus that he went about, he went about doing good. In Acts 10 and verse 38, that's what we're told. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's how Jesus spent his time, doing incredible things for the people around him. He healed the sick releasing them from terrible afflictions, in some cases releasing them from the very power and oppression of Satan. He acted with mercy and kindness and righteousness, and he spent his time teaching other people to do the same, to live with mercy, kindness, and righteousness. Not a single time did Jesus do anything that could not be called good. And of course, we know very well that's not, that's not how Barabbas lived at all. Barabbas lived a rough and unsavory kind of life. In Matthew 27 and verse 16, we learn that he was, he was a notorious prisoner. And at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, the verse says. He was well known, but not, but not beloved. In John 18 and verse 40, we read this. We learn, we learn, so they cried out again, saying, not this man, but, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was, was a robber. We learn that he was a robber. Most likely, most likely what we're talking about with Barabbas is not a guy who stole something once. We're talking about someone who is a hardened career criminal. He's a guy with a rap sheet a mile long. Mark's gospel teaches us that his list of misdeeds is crowned with the crimes of insurrection and murder. And the one named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the rebels who had committed murder in the revolt. Jesus, Jesus went about doing good, but Barabbas was a robber, criminal, insurrectionist, murderer. We also learn and we know that Jesus endured a, a, a sham of a trial, it was a trial that was conducted illegally under the cover of darkness and was conducted in such a way that it would ensure he was found guilty even though everyone knew he was undeniably innocent. On the other hand, when we look at Barabbas, we see that he was probably given a very fair hearing. Jesus' arrest and trial, they're the ultimate act of injustice, but Barabbas is simply, he's simply getting the punishment that he so richly deserves. In fact, those who are in power 
those who are in power, those who are really in the know, who are unbiased and prejudiced, even they see what a stark difference there is between Jesus and Barabbas. As Pilate himself would say in, in John 19 and verse 14, See, I am, I am bringing him out to you so that you will know that I found no grounds at all for charges in this case. Another translation would say, I find no guilt in him. Again, in Matthew 27, verse 22, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said, Crucify him. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? Yet they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. Jesus is innocent. Barabbas is guilty. Jesus did good. Barabbas did evil. Jesus suffers great injustice. But for Barabbas, justice is being served. They are the ultimate contrast. And yet at the end of the day, at the end of this Friday, Barabbas goes free. And it is Jesus who is condemned and hung on the cross. In fact, in fact, it is the condemnation of Christ that, that, that makes freedom possible for Barabbas. It is the fact that, Je- that, that, that the crowds want to crucify Jesus so badly that, that enables Barabbas to go free. In Luke 23, verses 23 through 25, we read this, but they were insistent with loud voices demanding that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And so Pilate decided to have their demand carried out, and he released the man for whom they were asking, who had been thrown into prison for a revolt and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. That Friday, someone was going to occupy that third cross on Golgotha. And the only reason Barabbas escapes, the only reason he walks into freedom, is because Jesus does not escape. Jesus is not free. Jesus is condemned. Barabbas' fate was sealed, but Jesus was chosen to take his place on the cross. And I want you to think about what that must have been like for Barabbas. Can you imagine? Can you imagine sitting there slumped against the wall in that dark, wet prison cell with the fear washing over you like waves? And then realizing, realizing that for some inexplicable reason, you weren't going to suffer the fate that you thought you were going to receive. For some inexplicable reason, some other person stood in your place, bore your punishment. Some other person was bruised for your iniquities. Some other man got nailed to the cross that was meant for you. How amazing. How amazing it must be to be Barabbas. Of course, you and I both know that we don't have to imagine that, do we? Because at the end of the day, all of us, all of us really are Barabbas. See, what happened to Barabbas is exactly what has happened to each and every one of us. The story of Barabbas is a physical representation of the spiritual reality for everyone here who's been saved by the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3 is a well-known passage. It says, And you were dead, you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. Paul says that we... We were dead in our offenses. We were dead men walking before Jesus, before he saved us. Our time on earth was nothing more than death row. Prisoner. A prisoner waiting for my sentence to be carried out. But Jesus took my place. As we learn, we learn in 1 John 1 John chapter 2 and verses 1 through 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Later in 1 John, in 1 John 4 verses 9 through 10. By this the love of God was, was revealed in us, that God has sent his only Son to the world 
so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That idea of propitiation is the idea of a substitute. John tells us that Jesus took our place. He suffered, he suffered for my sins. And so this morning, as we spend this time beholding the cross and thinking about, thinking about our Lord, our Savior, and the death that he endured, I want to challenge you to not simply, don't simply think about the cross as something that Jesus endured for you, but think about the cross as something that Jesus endured instead of you. Because when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he was nailed there in my place. The truth is that I deserve the blows to the face. I deserve to be spat upon. The lashes that he received belong on my back. The nails that were driven in his hands and feet deserve to be driven into mine. My side should be riven by a spear. It is I who should cry out and say, I thirst. And it's I who, should, who ought to hang on the cross, gasping for breath until, until I slowly suffocate. If justice were truly to be served, then the people would cry out, crucify Jonathan, and not a single person would stand up and say, why? What evil has he done? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The death that he bore was meant for me, yet he took my place. And like Barabbas, because of his death on the cross, I don't have to go to the cross. But instead, my shackles are unlocked. The door of death's prison is thrown open. And I'm let out into freedom, into that bright Friday morning sun. Brothers and sisters, we live in freedom because of Jesus. Think about that, freedom. Freedom rather than death. Every day we get to enjoy wonderful freedom that Jesus bought for us by dying in our place. Barabbas was released from uncomfortable, horrid conditions in a first century prison, but I'm released from something far much worse, from, from something far worse. I'm released from a prison that is much worse than that. I'm released from sin's captivity and the terrible things that it may do to me. Barabbas was freed from an impending death sentence, but I'm, re- I'm freed from something far worse, from the sentence of eternal death. Barabbas walks away from his prison with new hope, a hope that he can live a new life without death hanging over his head. But when I walk away from my baptism, I walk away with a much better hope, the hope of eternal life, the hope that I can spend eternity with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the rest of the saved. You know, it's interesting to think about Barabbas and the freedom that he enjoyed. What do you think he did with his new lease on life? How do you respond? How would you respond if you knew there was a sentence of death hanging over your head, but there was somebody else who was taken and nailed to the cross instead of you, and because of that, you got to walk free? What did he do with his life? The scripture leaves that open-ended, and I think that's for a purpose. It causes us to wonder and ask ourselves, what will I do with my new lease on life? How have I responded to the freedom that Christ bought for me by going to the cross in my stead? This morning, as we do every Sunday, we celebrate our Savior who made our freedom possible. He made it possible for us to walk into freedom just like Barabbas did on that bright Friday morning. And he did that. He did that by suffering what we were meant to suffer. And so today we celebrate him and as we partake, we, we remember him because, because he, he stood in our place. And so as we eat the bread and as we drink the cup, let us remember that his cross truly was my cross. His cross truly was your cross. Let us never forget that Jesus died in my place 
in everything that I enjoy. My freedom from sin, my freedom from eternal death, my new lease on life, my wonderful hope that, that encourage me, encourages me and uplifts me, that hope, that hope we hold on to when bad things happen to us, when we lose those that we love, that hope, that hope was bought by Jesus when he died in my place. Let us remember these things as we partake. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Lord, our God, we thank you so much for Jesus. He was your son, the savior of mankind. And he did not, he did not regard equality with you as a thing to be grasped, but we thank you that he emptied himself. And he came here to serve us by submitting himself to death on the cross. We thank you for the life that he chose to live here on earth that buys our freedom by his sacrifice. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let us pray for the cup. O oh Lord our God, we tremble to imagine and conceive of the pain that your son endured as he suffered in our place. We tremble to think that what he suffered is what we deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saving us from our fate. Thank you so much for, for holding back your wrath against mankind and allowing your son to suffer in such a way so that he, through his death, could win our freedom. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper is now concluded. 
At this time, as a matter of convenience, we also want to make mention of the, uh, the contribution that we, that we take every single Sunday. And the Lord has blessed us in, in so many wonderful ways. Uh, but, but the Bible makes sure that, that it mentions and it lets us know that the blessings we receive are given to us by God, not just for us to take and, and to keep for ourselves, but they are given to us so that we might use those blessings to further his purposes. He says that when he gives us these, these resources, he is giving seed to the sower. God intends for us to use our financial blessings in order to further his purposes. And one of the ways that we do that is by giving to the work of the Lord, by giving to this church. Now, what we do this morning is not a solicitation of our guests, but rather it's a requirement of our members here to support the work that we do, uh, to give seed to this church so that we might sow the gospel uh, and continue to spread the gospel in this area and in other places. So if, there, if you would like to give this morning, there are several ways to do that. You can give at the, at the exits. There are baskets to collect that. Or you can use the Givelify app and give, give in that way. At this time, let's pray for the contribution. Dear Lord our God, we thank you for the blessings you give us. And we pray that you would give us perspective. And you would give us a, a, a presence of mind about the wonderful things we have. We tend to see the things that we have as our own rather than as uh, your possessions, which we merely manage while we're here on this earth. Please help us to remember why we have the things we have. And as we give today, let us give with a cheerful heart, knowing that we are using what you've given us for your purposes, and that is a wonderful thing. Please help us, and help us to give cheerfully, help us to give generously. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? We're going in the Old Testament for just a bit today to the book of Daniel, to the book of Daniel. And while we will study there, we'll be in a variety of other places as well. So we'll ask you to open your Bibles there, though, by way of beginning today. Good to see all of you this morning. So happy that you're with us. If you're visiting with our church family today, we especially welcome you. Thank you for coming our way. Thank you for sharing worship with us today. And we have a lot of folks today we know that are joining us via live stream. We have uh, some of our members who, because of some health concerns and the surge with COVID, have have decided to uh, join via live stream today, and we certainly understand that. Happy that we have that technology available, and so we can be together that way also. But we're glad to have all of you with us today. Great to see all of our college students today. We had a wonderful singing Wednesday night, so many college students with us. That was outstanding. We hope you've had a great first week of school, and uh, hope that's the first of many, many more as well. I want to remind you that this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'll begin our college class. College class meets just right upstairs. When you come in the foyer and go up the stairs, uh, hang a right, and it will take you directly to the college class. And Jonathan Banning is going to be teaching that, and you will enjoy and profit from that, I know. Great to see all of our college students. I'm looking forward to being with all of you down the street tomorrow in chapel as well. This has been a week in our church family. We uh, began this week by losing Mike Cawthon, and that is a terrible blow to our congregation. Mike served us so well as a shepherd for so many years, made an impact for good in so many different lives, and just was a friend to so many of us. He will be without doubt missed greatly. We grieve with his good family. We rejoice for the good things that he's enjoying now as he lived his life as a Christian. And the end of the week saw the passing of Glenn Williams. And Glenn was such a good man. And I said in the email yesterday, it's interesting that Mike had such an affinity for Glenn and Glenn for Mike, and their, their passings bookended this particular week. Mary is with us today, and just an amazing woman of faith in so many ways. And we grieve with this good family as well. This is an interesting time in our nation. It's an interesting time when Satan seems to be after so many churches. And it seems a time of loss for so many people. I've got to travel to Indiana this week <clears throat> to, uh, to do the funeral for a lady that I've known for over 30 years. Her family's been very, very close to mine. Her children and grandchildren are very close to us, and she passed this week as well. And so it's been a week of loss. So we need days like today. We need the Lord's Day. We need days that remind us that we get a fresh start and a new beginning today. We need days and weeks to remind us that God renews His mercies to us, new and fresh, every single morning, an opportunity to start over and begin fresh with fresh perspective about life. And so I'm glad that we can share that together today. I was thinking about <clears throat> the, the title this morning just a few minutes ago, This Should Be Interesting. That's a dangerous title for a sermon because I thought about halfway through, some of you may be saying, it should be, but it's not. And that's a, yeah, that's a dangerous thing to think about. But I think you'll understand the, the wording of the title in just, in just a minute or two. You know, this week was in past, uh, this last week was, was in fact back to school. It was back to school for our college students, and the week before that for our K through 12 students. Now, I always like the beginning of school. In fact, I like the beginning of school, the middle of school, and the end of school. I, I just, I've told you before, I liked almost everything about school. But the beginning in particular, because that's a time, that's a time to recalibrate. It's time to refocus. It's a time to, to it's a time to learn. I like to learn. I hope you do as well. I hope that I will be a lifelong learner. My parents instilled that in me. Christianity is a thinking man's faith. It is a religion whereby we learn, and we learn continually, always, again, until the day that we die. But learning is essential to the process. And so Jesus would say, I want you to take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The psalmist would say in Psalm 90 and 12, Lord, teach me. Teach me to number my days that I may gain a heart of a heart of wisdom. And in Luke 11, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to pray. And so learning is just indispensable to life. But learning is not always easy. The great and wise philosopher and theologian Kermit the Frog once said that it's tough being green. 
And it's tough being green if you interpret green as new. It's hard to be new at something and uninformed at something and green at something uninitiated about something. You see that in a lot of ways. For example, I, I just imagine that there are a lot of the senior citizens in this audience who've probably been carrying the same cell phone for multiple years now. Why? Because you don't want to, you do not want to begin trying to learn how to use the features of a new phone. You know who you are. Now, we're no judgment in that, understand, but it's just hard. It's hard being green about, about that. It's hard sometimes learning to drive. Now, for those of us who've been driving for so many years, it's just natural. We don't even think about it. It's instinctive. But when you're just learning how to drive, there's so much. You've got people who are changing lanes without looking, and they're, and they're riding on your bumper sometimes. And there are those dreaded blind spots, and it's just it's hard. It's just tough being green. I asked you to open a minute to go to the book of Daniel, and yet... This lesson, when all is said and done, isn't so much about Daniel and his, three, and his three friends, although it does base itself there just a bit. Now, you know the story of Daniel. We're not going to take the time to recite all of that this morning. I would say about these, these four young men <clears throat> that there are two or three things here that are pretty important. The first is that they were just that. They were young. They were young. And we can understand that from some of the terminology in the first chapter, but if for nothing else, in Daniel chapter 6, in that whole episode with Daniel and the lion's den, 70 years have passed from chapter 1. And so he's still working. He's still employed. He's still a civil servant. So that tells us that he must have been pretty young back in chapter 1. And secondly, they are away from home. And that's notable as well because there's safety at home. Safety is a security blanket. Mom and dad can pretty well make almost anything right. They can almost always answer whatever question or dilemma that you may have. This past week, I heard about a I read about a college student who was away from home for the first time. He was at college, and he called his mom and he said, "Mom, how do I how do I wash how do I wash my college sweatshirt?" And she said, "Well, son, that 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 depends. What does the sweatshirt say?" And here was a long pause, and he finally said, "It says Alabama." Well, there you go. Uh, No offense to those of you from Alabama. Uh, Well, maybe a little bit, but but. Mom and dad could almost always answer your questions. They could make things right. They could almost always take care of any dilemma. But the major thing about these young men is that they were forced to make life-altering decisions. In fact, they did that on a continual basis, it seems to me, almost day by day. And then ultimately, they were called to make a decision that would affect their lives. And so they had to make some very tough, tough decisions. How does that equate to where our young people are, whether it's K through 12 or whether it's these wonderful college students who are here? Well, the fact of the matter is that almost every day you're going to face some tough decisions, sometimes life-altering decisions as well. You know, we said the title of this lesson is This Should Be Interesting. I say that a lot. In fact, I say that just almost all the time. Whenever I'm entering a new situation or a challenging situation or a situation where I really don't know what's going to transpire, I almost always instinctively say, well, this should be interesting. This should be interesting. Because there's an element of excitement in that because you don't know exactly what it is going to be. Well, so too with the new school year. There are going to be great challenges. So I want to say some things today to our college students and to, our, to our, our students who are a part of our church family, particularly those of you who are a little bit older. And you get in those middle school years and high school years, and there really are some significant challenges there. And I want to talk just a little bit about some things that Daniel and his friends learned that you're going to learn as well. And let's see if we can make an application too very quickly, and then the lesson will be yours. Let me tell you some things that they learned. They learned, first of all, that not everybody, <clears throat> not everybody is who they ought to be. It's one of the most fundamental things that you learn. Once you get outside the cocoon of family and you get outside the cocoon of, of your friends, just those that you're with, one of the things you learn pretty quickly is that not everybody is who they ought to be. That's a tough lesson. Not all fellow students are nice. Not all teachers and professors are nice. Not all individuals in positions of authority. When you get beyond school and you have a job, not everybody in position of authority is nice. The fact of the matter is that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood exists 
only on TV. Not everybody does nice things. Jesus acknowledged that. He said, this is condemnation that light's come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And the fact of the matter is just saying that not everybody is going to do right, nice things with you. And particularly at school, and particularly when you leave kind of the cocoon of, of the school down the street, you discover that almost immediately, that what you believe may be assaulted, and what you value may be insulted. When I left Florida College, I made a very quick pit stop at the University of Louisville on my way to Indiana University, and I'll never forget that my very first day, I believe it was in my very first class, the professor, and I've, I've been at Florida College, right? My very first day, my very first class, the professor comes in, and he lets all of us know, first of all, that he is gay, that he's a homosexual, and secondly, that he is an atheist, and third, he doesn't want to hear anything about it. And so that was my introduction to that world. The fact of the matter is that not everybody is always going to help you do what's right. And that's true no matter where you are. That's true, by the way, also in the school down the street. You'll find what you're looking for. If you're looking for friends who will help you do wrong, you'll be able to find them. In fact, Solomon said in 10 and 23 of Proverbs, a fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes, but a person of understanding, delights and wisdom. In other words, you will always find whatever it is that you're looking for. The upshot of that, of course, is that we have to be careful in life. You've got to be careful with a variety of things. You've got to be careful with who you call a friend, because that verse that your mom and dad have told you over and over and over, and you've heard a million times, that not, don't be deceived, that, that bad company will corrupt good habits or destroy good morals is exactly right. And so you need to be careful about who you make your close and intimate friends. And along with that, going hand in glove with that, is being careful about what you share about your life and really who you share the intimate details of your life with because not everybody can be trusted. A perverse person will stir up conflict. A gossip will separate close friends. And whoever would foster love will cover over an offense. There's some people that you can, you can give your life to and they will protect you always. But there are some who will be happy to use that in an unflattering way. And so we have to be careful again about those whom we make our close and intimate friends. And beyond that then, that would mean particularly for those of you who are older, you've got to be careful who you date because we tend to marry people that we date. And we need to remember that at the very beginning of the Bible, one of the things that was so important to God that he put this on page two of the Bible the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone, so I'm going to make a helper, a helper comparable or suitable for him. And it's not just a helper, but really, you know, when you think about that, you need to make sure that you're going to date and then marry somebody who's going to get, help you get to heaven and somebody you can pray with, and somebody you can worship with, and somebody who will remind you of, of doing right, and somebody who will encourage you to do right always. It's really important because not everyone is who they ought to be. Daniel and his friends learned that immediately. And if you're of some age at school or in college, certainly you're going to learn that. Secondly, they learned also that not everything in life is going to make sense. You'll learn that as well, no matter where you are in school, that not everything in life will make sense. Now, here's a statement out of Jeremiah where the prophet said, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Now, part of the reason for that is that when we direct our own steps, we always go in the way that makes perfect sense to us. But simply because it makes sense to us doesn't necessarily mean that it will make sense to God. It would have been so easy for Daniel if we think about Daniel for just a minute again, Daniel, he's been taken captive. He's down in Babylonia now. He's one of the noble. He's part of the royal family in Israel. And they come, they take these royal hostages. They take them back to Babylon because <clears throat> they can use them as bargaining ships. They need to have tribute money paid to them. They need to have obeisance given and served to them. And one of the ways they could maintain that with lands that they had invaded 
was by taking the best and brightest of their young people and people who were the royal family, where the royal family would do anything to keep them alive. And Daniel is put in a special program along with his friends because they are, in fact, brilliant. And so it would have been easy for Daniel to compromise. I mean, it would have been easy for him to say what many of us might have said. He could have said, look, nobody's ever going to know. I'm away from home. Who's going to know what I do? Not my priest, not my parents. Nobody is going to know. Or he could have said, look, I'm a captive in a foreign land, and so I really don't have any choice about this at all. But the fact is, he did have a choice. One of the greatest verses in all the book of Daniel, if not the greatest verse in the book of Daniel, is Daniel 1, the beginning of verse 8, that Daniel that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Daniel resolved. He made up his mind. Daniel, some translations say, purposed in his heart. Now, you got to understand that in that culture, Daniel had been singled out to be put in a special program with special privileges and special blessings. And so his culture was saying to Daniel, look, Daniel, you're special you're advanced. Whatever rules may apply to others, they don't really apply to you. Our culture says the same thing. Our culture says, look, homosexuality isn't a choice. Pornography is harmless. Adultery and fornication are natural and normal. Divorce is to be expected. Lying is sometimes necessary. Stealing is sometimes justified. And you, in fact, are the center of your world. And that's what Daniel was told. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. What a great word that is, resolved. It's the principle of Psalm 19 and beginning in verse 112, where the psalmist said, I've inclined my heart to perform your statutes. Look at this. Forever to the very end. Don't miss that. I have resolved, inclined my heart to perform forever unto the very end, regardless of what <clears throat> that end may, may bring. Or this statement from Ezra 7, that the prophet Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Make no mistake, young people. If you haven't resolved not to defile yourself, you will. You'll do what others do. You'll say what others say. You'll do what's easy. You'll do what doesn't draw unwanted attention to you as a Christian. But don't miss this either. If Daniel 1 and 8 is the greatest verse in all the book of, of Daniel, the next verse is so critically important because it says that God noticed that. Daniel resolved not to defile himself and the very next verse says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. And the point of it is that because Daniel resolved, God acted on Daniel's behalf. Could it be, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes we don't see God act as powerfully in our lives as we would like? Could it be because we have not resolved not to fit in? Or because we go with the flow? Or because sometimes we are indistinguishable from the people in the world around us. From a human perspective, serving God will not always make sense. Third, third this morning. Not every choice is easy. I'm going to say almost nothing about this because... <clears throat> I'm just about to do some preaching on Sundays about the kind of commitment that it takes and what kind of difference that commitment would make in our life when we decide whether or not the choice is easy or difficult, it doesn't matter. We're going to do exactly what the psalmist said a moment ago, forever to the end, we're going to choose to do what's right. Now for the four Hebrews <clears throat> around whom the book of Daniel centers, the choice not only was not easy, it, it was going to be a life and death choice. There was a choice made far beyond those young men in the Bible. There's a New Testament passage that tells us about it in Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about Moses and says, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known 
as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I've talked about that a lot from this pulpit. The son, he, he, didn't, he refused to be called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What word would that be? What word would we use for that? What would he have been to Pharaoh? He would have been his grandson. He would have been his grandson. He, he would have been the grandson of Pharaoh. And the Egyptians considered Pharaoh a god. He would have been the grandson of a god. Now, I got to tell you, I, I know how I treat my grandkids. Now, I would imagine Pharaoh would have done the same. That would have been a pretty good position to be in. But instead of that, Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. The last phrase is important because it says that, that sin always brings pleasure. I mean, we, it, if sin wasn't pleasurable, there would be no temptation to it. The challenge for all of us, whether you're a college student or younger, or whether it's, it's someone like me with a lot of miles on me now, the challenge for all, for all of us is that the choice is so often between our head and our heart between what we know to be right, but what in our heart we'd like to do. It's between what we know and what we feel. That's a challenge. We're going to leave that there because we want to, we want to explore that a little further. Fourth <clears throat> and finally, everything hinges on conviction. Everything hinges on conviction. Now, if you just kind of been riding along with me this morning and, and really just kind of going along and getting along, but not really paying a lot of attention, I, I want to ask you to, to really hone in with me now for just a couple of minutes. Everything hinges on conviction. The stories with which everyone is familiar in the book of Daniel, the story of Daniel in chapter one, <clears throat> but then, and of course, the story of Daniel in chapter six with the lion's den episode. But the other story with which everybody is familiar is in chapter 3, and it's the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Now, those were not their Hebrew names. Their Hebrew names were taken away from them, and they were given the names of Babylonian gods. But Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and you remember the story in chapter 3 where Nebuchadnezzar has been manipulated into creating a 90-foot image of gold and the people from all the nations, the representatives are to come and they are to bow before it because it was a way, what he was doing clearly, you got to try to find a way to consolidate all these nations that you have captured. How are you going to keep them all loyal? <clears throat> well, you make them worship in the same way. And so there was a command that when the music played that everybody would bow. And you remember that story. Now that's a dilemma for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego because the very first Hebrew commandment of the Ten Commandments of the Decalogue was, you shall have no other gods before me. And the second one was, you shall not make any graven image or any likeness of anything and call that a god. And so now they've got a problem on their hands. And so the music plays, and for as far as the eye can see, everybody hits the ground except these three. And Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> is irate about that. And he tells them, you're either going to bow or you're going to burn. That's your choice. And look at their response. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. There are two critical statements in those two verses that we, <clears throat> we just need to look at before we stop this morning. Because everything hinges on conviction. Conviction is what you believe. Conviction is what you do when nobody else in the world is looking. Conviction is what you do when you are under pressure. And here's what they did. They said, first of all, O oh God, our, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. That's a great statement. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. 
And I got to tell you, there are a lot of people in this audience this morning that I know, that I know have learned firsthand that our God is able. He is able to deliver from grief and despair. He's able to mend a broken marriage. He's able to heal sickness and disease. He's able to remove overwhelming, debilitating guilt. He is able to provide when the outlook is bleak. He is able to return the prodigal child. He is able to rescue and to save and to redeem. Our God is able. And Nebuchadnezzar has asked, what God is able? And their answer again is, our God. Our God is able. We sometimes ask that question. What God is able? What God is able to to soften hard hearts? Our God is able. What God is able to bring peace in a house of conflict. Our God is able, what God is able to bring purpose and meaning to a life that is only characterized by confusion. Our God is able, what God is able to forgive the deepest, darkest, most vile, ugly sins. Our God is able. But here's the challenge of that. It took a while for God to deliver Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. It took a while for him to to deliver Daniel. When they were captured and exiled in Babylon, don't don't you know, don't you know that as they were on their way to Babylon, that they prayed every single day that God would deliver them from these, their captors. Don't you know that when they saw that statue being built, don't you know that they prayed for God to rescue them from the day of its completion? Don't you know that when they stood, when everybody else bowed, for as far as the eye could see, all you could see was people on their face, and they were the only three standing. Don't you know that they prayed that nobody would notice? Don't you know that when they stood before the most powerful monarch on the face of the earth, and the text says that he was in a furious rage with them. Don't you know that they repent, they prayed that he would repent of his intentions? And ladies and gentlemen, in all of those prayers, God said no. And so the longer it went, the more faith it required, even to the point of being willing to die. And still they believe, still their conviction was our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. The second important statement in these verses is this. Three simple words. But if not. But if he doesn't, we will not bow. This isn't like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz where you click your heels three times and you're extricated from a bad situation and you're back home safe and sound. No, this is life and death. And this is such an important lesson. Young people, please, this is such an important lesson for young and old alike, that we need to be willing to say, we need to be willing to say to family, sometimes to friends. Sometimes you have to say it to a boss, to an employer. Sometimes you have to be willing to say, look, you don't like my stand, fine. But your pressure, your unhappiness, your action is not going to change what is right, and it will not change me either. That's conviction. How did these men, and how do we come to have that kind of conviction? There are two key elements in that that are are at play in 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 this story. The first is that faith was the foundation of their lives. Faith was the foundation of their lives. These boys, these Hebrew boys, had heard the great stories of faith. They knew They knew when they said our God is able to deliver us, they said that because they knew that God had delivered Moses from the Red Sea and he had delivered David from Goliath and he had delivered Elijah from the prophets of Baal. And they said that same God is able to deliver us. We serve that same God. We serve the same God who has the same power and love for his people. It's why Paul said in Ephesians 3 and verse 20, our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we've ever asked or thought through his power that works in us. Faith 
was the foundation of their lives. And for most of you who are in college right now, you are at this place, at this point in time in your life, because your mom and dad gave you a heritage of faith. You cannot go to heaven on their faith. You can't live off the fumes of their faith, but they gave you a foundation of faith. And it ought to make you be able to say, our God, our God is able. And secondly, and this is so critically important, friendship was the strength that they needed. Friendship was a strength that they needed. I've wondered so many times how this story would have been different if Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had been trying to withstand the pressure all by themselves. If it had only been one instead of three, would the story have been the same? The fact of the matter is that they had each other to lean on. Every person in this audience, every person in this audience who's, who's again, who's got some mileage on them, will tell you that when they've undergone some severe, life-shaking kind of trial, when they've, when they've faced the cold wind of doubt, and they have, in fact, questioned their faith, every one of them will tell you that the insulation of friends, that the presence of friends, that the comfort of friends, the encouragement of friends and brethren made all the difference in the world. What an amazing spirit that these people had. God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, he is the only God that we will worship. I'm going to follow God, even when I don't have all the answers. I'm going to follow God, even when I have more questions than answers. I'm going to worship God, even when some things in life make absolutely no sense to me at all. I'm going to say, look, God, I know you were able to deliver me. I know you can deliver me from this sickness or from this disease or from this loneliness or this childlessness or this rebellion. I know that you can deliver me from all of that. But even if you don't, I'm going to worship you and serve you and you alone. That, ladies and gentlemen, is conviction. Now, here's the end of this story. Do you have your Bible? <clears throat> I ask you to open the book of Daniel. I want you to read with me in Daniel chapter 3. A single verse at the end of this story that to me is so fascinating, and it's seldom ever discussed. Now, I've talked about it several times with this audience, and I want to share it with the young people with us today. So, they're thrown in the fiery furnace. They survive. And when they come and they're, they're looking, when the Babylonians are looking in the furnace, the king is amazed. And look at verse 25 of Daniel 3. Look, he answered, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I think that verse, ladies and gentlemen, is so very important. If we take that, that that is in fact the Son of God speaking to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, wouldn't you have loved to have heard the conversation? Wouldn't you love to know what he said to them? I would imagine, young people, that he would say the same thing to them that he would say to you when you have successfully faced a challenge, a challenge of integrity, or a challenge regarding morality, or a challenge of faith at school or at college. I think he probably said to them, and I think he would say to you on those occasions, I think he would tell you how proud he is of you, and how, how maybe all of heaven was watching you to see how you were going to respond and the way you were going to act and speak. And maybe he would say, look, all of heaven rose to their feet and applauded and cheered for you when you, when you refused to do wrong and did right. And I wonder if he'd say you need to understand that God was with you all along, that you were never, ever truly alone. And that's the point. Don't miss that in Daniel 3 and 25. Don't miss the point that God is saying, and the Holy Spirit is writing, and he is reminding us that when you are in a furnace, you're never alone. I will be with you. God says, don't ever 
Don't ever forget that. Let's pray together before we stop this morning. Dear God, thank you for the beauty of this Lord's day and thank you for fresh starts and new beginnings. And this morning, Father, I simply pray for every student who is in this room. Whether they are young and just beginning the early years of their education or whether they are in those very challenging middle school years and high school years or whether they are these wonderful and amazing and talented college students. I pray, Holy God, that you would keep them. And as your son prayed for us, not that we would be taken out of the world, we pray simply that they will be kept safe from the evil one. That they will be the friends to each other that will encourage and help and motivate and inspire to do right. We pray that they will be young men and women of conviction and courage. And we pray that they and we will always remember that we are never alone, for you are with us. We pray to you in Jesus' name, and amen. So we began this morning by talking about fresh starts and new beginnings. And one of the things we do at the conclusion of our services is provide an opportunity to make a fresh start with God, have a new beginning as his child. <clears throat> Sometimes we need to do that, even though we've been God's children for a long, long time. Aren't you grateful that when we sin and when we fall, that God allows us as his children to come home to him. Sometimes we need to do that just in the quietude of our heart and ask God to forgive us. Sometimes we may need to do that in a more public way. But then there are those who've never been baptized into Christ. Sometimes they've grown up in a circumstance like this, they've been in an environment like this, and they understand exactly what God would have them do, but yet for some reason, somehow, some way, they've just never done that. This would be a great day to begin, to start your walk with God. And so if you need to be baptized today or if you need to come home to your Father, this invitation is for you. Let's stand and let's sing. To be my blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. And it is wonderful to be with you today. Thank you so much for being here, assembled with the Lord's people, to uh, worship Him and uh, remember His Son, study a little bit in His Word. I pray you've been uplifted and encouraged by what we've done this morning. In just a moment, we're going to have a song, and we'll have a prayer, and we'll be dismissed. But before that, I want to make a few, make a mention of a few things. Uh, Don already mentioned at the top of his sermon, but I'd like to say again, uh, last week we, we lost two great men in our church family, uh, both Mike Cawthon and Glenn Williams, uh, and we're, we're sorry for their families, but we are happy for those men uh, because both of them put their hope in Jesus and uh, gave their lives to Jesus in exchange for the hope of heaven, and that's, that's a wonderful thing that we can rejoice in even as we sorrow. So please remember their families. Uh, make sure you, you comfort them in the best way that you know how and continue to pray for them as they deal with these losses at this time. I uh, want to also make mention... Uh, our brother Lynn Wade, he remains in the hospital, uh, so please make sure you keep praying for his recovery. 
from COVID-19. I want to also make mention of Susan Salzer. That is uh, Jesse Salzer's grandmother. Uh, she was not, she's not suffering with COVID. She was taken to the hospital with symptoms of a heart attack. Uh, last I heard, she is still in the hospital. She is awaiting the results of some tests. Uh, she seems to be in stable condition, though. So make sure you pray for Susan Salzer. That's the grandmother of our Jesse Salzer. Finally, uh, remember, college students, college class begins tonight. Looking forward to studying with you guys this semester. Tonight at 5 p.m., up the stairs to the right. And I look forward to opening the word with you guys then. Uh, I have no more announcements. If you'll please, uh, well, remain standing. And uh, Devin, lead us and then we'll pray. Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful that we had the opportunity this morning to come together as a group of, of believers and worship you, we trust, in spirit and in truth. We ask, Father, as we leave this place of worship, that we will remember that you are more than able to deliver us. And that through faith and by your grace, we will spend eternity with you in the after a while. So grateful for the sacrifice made in our behalf and that we have a, a hope, a confident hope, that when this life is over, it is not over for those of us who believe. Help us to understand that as we endeavor to walk in, in the light of your word, that it will not always be easy. Our Savior learned obedience by the things that he suffered, and so shall we. But we need to not have a a false view of just how difficult it is to walk in the, in the pathways of righteousness. It is natural for all of us, apart from God, to sin. And if we hope to walk in the light like you are in the light, then we will have to commit ourselves fully and get ready to fight a good fight. And I trust that we all will. Thank you for, for enlightening us, and thank you for the good teaching that is coming from this place, and that each time that we meet, we are refreshed by the powerful, life-changing words of God. And that's your power, Lord. That's where the change comes, and we're thankful for that. And, and we believe your words, and we are trying diligently to Walk in those ways as each day grows into the next. Be with us. Thank you once again for this opportunity to come together. And be with us and strengthen us until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>